Joining us live from Singapore to discuss that is Global Investor and Chairman of Rogers Holdings, Jim Rogers. Thank you very much indeed for joining us, Mr. Rogers, today. Um, can we begin by looking at China and uh, that GDP figure and your reaction to it? Well, I don't pay too much attention to GDP figures from any government. You know, they're, first of all, it's backward looking. Second of all, they make them up. They're always revised later. I know you have to report things on TV, but as an investor, I don't pay any attention. Now, we had the interest rate uh, hike as well in, uh, in China. What does that tell you? Are you confident that uh, China really is getting its, uh, its economy under control? I do pay attention to things like that because the Chinese have been raising interest rates. They know they have a, an inflation problem. They know that they have a real estate bubble in urban coastal areas, and they're trying to deal with both. That sort of thing I, I watch. It is good what they're doing. I think they can do other things as well. I wish in the United States and the UK, our governments would acknowledge that inflation is here and do something about it. But you know the, you know the rest of that story. <laughs> well, we will talk a lot more about uh, the US and the UK uh, later. But you said that there's more they could do about the property bubbles. Uh, what else would you like to see China do? Well, China has a blocked currency. Now, they have been opening it up more and more in the past five years and certainly in the past uh, year or two. But that's part of the problem. They have all that money trapped in China. It cannot get out. And so it's got to go somewhere. Mm. So it's going into the property market. If they open the currency up, it would be good for China. It would be good for the Chinese. It would be good for the world. And it might prevent the property bubble which is taking place. On the question of uh, allowing the yuan to trade more freely and to appreciate, is it more difficult to persuade China that that would be a good idea when effectively through QE uh, the U.S. is going to be devaluing the dollar? <laughs> Look, I'm not in favor of, of, of printing more money either. That's a, that's a different story. Of course, any time you bash somebody in the face, they're going to say, wait a minute, I've got to protect my face, I've got to protect myself. So sitting here and hitting the Chinese over the head is not going to do much good. It's just going to make things worse. I would just stay out of the way if I were the U.S. in this case. The Chinese know they have to open their currency. They've been opening it slower than I would, but they've been opening it, more so than apparently the Western press understands. It's a problem that they are addressing, not addressing it fast enough in my view. And what would you, uh, what do you predict that they will do with the yuan? Can you see it uh, being allowed to appreciate more freely over a period of, say, the next 12 months? Oh, they're, they're doing it already. They've, mm. they've opened it up with Malaysia and Russia and several of their neighboring countries. The currency is tradable. You can, you can do business in, uh, and trade the currency with those uh, neighboring currencies. So it's opening up. Will they make it completely convertible in the tw next 12 months? You shouldn't ask me. I thought they would do it by 2008. So you, <laughs> you see how much I know. I'm totally out of it. Um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, currencies elsewhere. We've seen uh, what happened in the UK yesterday with the uh, spending uh, cuts. Now, you've been pretty bearish on sterling for a while. Have you seen anything recently that's changed your view? No, no. You know, the UK has a gigantic uh, debt problem, a gigantic balance of trade problem. I, look, I love the UK. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. I have had some of the greatest experiences of my life in the UK. But it's not a place for me to invest, not in 2010. Okay. Um, uh, now, in terms of the currency wars, that uh, probably a phrase that has been slightly overplayed. But is the concern about individual devaluation going to overshadow what's taking place at the G20? Is that a concern? It is a terrible concern for me. You know, if we have a if the trade war continues, it's going to be the end of all of us. In the 1930s, we had a trade war. It led to the Great Depression and ultimately to the Second World War. No one has ever, ever won a trade war. Everyone loses a trade war. If the trade war gets worse, that's the end of the game. The world economy is going to be in trouble for a long time to come. Unfortunately, most politicians have not read their, their history or their economics, and they don't know the dire consequences of a trade war. Mr. Rogers, 
These, uh, these rare materials, these rare metals, are another issue in what could potentially be an issue with, uh, with trade. Trade war might sound a little bit too strong, but uh, China does seem to have a stranglehold over this particular commodity. Well, China apparently does have about 95% of the world's developed reserves of rare earths. Now, there are lots of rare earths in the world. It's just that it takes a long time to bring those mines on stream. Mm. And unfortunately, for the rest of the world, the Chinese have theirs on stream and ready to go, and the rest of us don't. Now, we are seeing some kind of a restriction here on uh, how much of that is available to the rest of the world. Are you concerned about the idea of those kind of restrictions being in place and then us end ending up in a kind of a tit-for-tat issue with the United States and elsewhere? Well, of course. Now, from, from the Chinese point of view, mm. needless to say, they've got their own booming economy. They have a huge demand for rare earths, and if they have them and they have their own need, it's logical that they would keep them for themselves. Everybody would do that, the British, the Australians, the Americans, everybody. It might, however, at least give the rest of us an incentive to go out and develop some of our own rare earths. As I said before, Ms. Catherwood, there are lots of rare earths in the world. It's just that it takes a long time to bring them on stream. Can I just ask a little bit about commodities in general? You know, you've always been very bullish on commodities, but with gold, silver, with, with prices at these levels at the moment, is there still value there for investors who aren't already in this market? Well, Ms. Catherwood, I don't ever like to buy something that's going straight up and making all-time highs, and that's what gold is right now. I read a survey recently that something like 95% of the people are bullish on gold. Whenever you have 95% of the people on any market, it's time to wait. Wait for a reaction or a correction. I own gold. I'm not selling it. Uh, I'd rather, however, buy some of the commodities which are depressed. I mean, rice is still very depressed. Mm. Even silver is 50% below its all-time high. When I look at commodity, when I look at anything, I look at the things that are depressed, not the things that are skyrocketing upward. Thank you very much for that advice. Now, look, let's look at the uh, at the U.S. I know that you do have concerns about the Fed printing more money, but how concerned are you overall about the slowdown in the U.S. economy? Well, Ms. Catherwood, I hope you have concerns about the U.S. printing money. Printing money has never worked. It's never been good for anybody. Many people have tried it throughout history. It's never worked in the long term or even the medium term, sometimes in the short term. No, I hope they don't do it. But unfortunately, the head of the central bank in America doesn't know anything else to do. And that's what he says. He's done it once. He says he's going to do it again. It didn't work the first time. It's not going to work this time. It didn't work in Japan in the 90s and the last decade. It's not good for any of us. But that's all he knows. Now, the other thing this is obviously affecting is it's affecting uh, banks in the U.S. Uh, and elsewhere. Basel III that was supposed to be about the, uh, or, or rather, um, uh, the G20 that was supposed to be about Basel III may end up being taken over by currencies. Uh, but what do you think of the banking sector at the moment overall? As a place to invest? Mm. No, no. I, I, usually when you have a, a huge bubble, and we had a big financial bubble in the U.S., and it pops, and the U.K. and other places, it usually takes a long time, several years, for them to work themselves out. I would suspect that you'll see banking shares in a trading range for a few years. If you're looking for something where there's a secular bull market, I don't think it's going to be in the, in the banking sector in, in our countries for several years. And where would you be looking? Where are the investment opportunities, if not in that sector? Well, in real assets. If the world economy gets better, the price of commodities is going to go up because there are shortages developing. We already see lots of shortages developing. You mentioned rare earths, but there are others. If, Ms. Catherwood, the world economy does not get better, I still won't own commodities because they're going to print money. That's all they know to do. They've already said we're going to print money if things don't get better. Throughout history, when they printed money, the place to protect yourself and to make money has been in real assets. So I would urge either way, if things get better or don't get better, I think I'm better off in commodities than other things. Jim Rogers, as always, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. A pleasure.